Hi, and welcome to Going Viral, the UK response to COVID-19. This is a webinar brought to you by Intelligent Health and Inspired Minds. I'm joined here by four guests. I will shortly introduce. My name is Margaret Meyer. I'm calling in from Zurich, Switzerland. I'm a journalist. I'm going to be hosting this uh, panel, online discussion panel. First, we have uh, Trish Greenall. She's a professor of primary care health sciences at Newfield Department of Primary Care Health Sciences. Hi, Trish. Hello, I'm from the University of Oxford. Hi. And then we have Chris Bates, uh, Director of Research at TPP. Good morning. Kate Jeffries, uh, Account Director for the DHSC NHS at Microsoft. Hi, guys. And Ian Hennessy, Clinical Director of Innovation at Alder Haight Children's Hospital. Hello. Hi. I will start uh, asking you, Trish, um, what's the current state of affairs in the UK right now? And what are the actual challenges we are facing in the UK, the clinical aspects and the different logistical challenges? Well, the UK, uh, if, if you've been following the statistics uh, coming out internationally, you'll know that the UK is a, the sort of steep rise of the curve at the moment. It, some places have no coronavirus, but there are places, particularly London, places near London, uh, where uh, the number of coronavirus cases uh, coming into hospitals has, has really already taken off big time, and they're already having shortages of beds and, and that kind of thing. Um, the GPs are pretty overwhelmed. The general practices and, and the practice nurses who are taking a lot of the calls are getting hundreds of calls a day from people with respiratory symptoms, with coughs, with fever, um, with uh, fatigue, worrying about whether or not this is going to turn into a serious case of coronavirus and i'm sure most people know that this this can be a very mild illness but it can also deteriorate particularly in the second week and so the other thing that the gps are picking up on is a lot of anxiety from people who uh think they might be you know about to become very sick but are not currently very sick so there's an awful lot of gatekeeping safety netting trying to manage that overwhelming demand and at policy level uh, i'm working with uh, people uh, nationally to try and get a, a kind of triage service done uh, remotely either online or by telephone so that patients can be directed into advice websites uh, self-management uh, to take a bit of pressure off the system and then the rest of the patients can be managed uh, remotely as far as possible. So that's where we are in the UK. So as in other countries as well, uh, relatively late with the response and um, struggling on several levels of, of policy making of uh, all kinds of governmental levels, um, legal levels. So um, to get a bit of an overview, um, one of the big difficulties, at least what I see in Switzerland right now, we're a few weeks ahead of, of you guys in certain um, certain ways, um, is that a lot of the difficulties is actually, for example, just collecting the data of tested, positively tested cases and actually um, recovering, recovering figures, uh, deaths, etc. So that's one of the main difficulties here right now. Um, Chris, you are... Um, Director of Research at TPP, and you're working with a system called System One. Yeah, yeah. The right. clinical computing system being used within the NHS. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so we we are we provide um, clinical systems and electronic patient records uh, across the NHS to about seven thousand organisations, um, supporting about two hundred thousand staff um, in total. Um, what we have seen really uh, has been the need for for people to be using those systems in new ways and as, as uh, trish has just said uh, we've seen a significant increase in in remote consultations and demand on gp practice there so um we have seen a, a double the number of uh, remote consultations that have happened uh, this monday as opposed to say uh, the monday previously with at least an extra hundred thousand so of course there are burdens there and pressures but people are using uh, the systems they've got. Some of the challenges around data have been um, um, how do we actually 
get emergency codes in there so we can start to to record this information and to count this information. Count this information. Coordinated then by the United Center along with uh, the supplier community really to say what codes can we get, how quickly can we release them, how can we start to uh, encourage GPs uh, and people working in, in other care settings to record these codes so we can start to get a good handle on the ground on as to what's, ground. Going on. what's going on. Some of those things, some of those things happen quite early, um, Chris, for example Chris, with Public Health England. I, your audio is off I think slightly. Maybe just slow down the, the speaking speed. Can I just say, Can Chris you... is missing his audio. Uh, there's a problem with testing yes, in the UK. Is that there's, they're not doing any testing in the community. So it's uh, that, that is about to change, I think. But, but certainly I've got colleagues in London who are saying that with there's lots and lots of cases clinically in the community, but uh, they can't at the moment be tested. Uh, they're only testing the sort of cases that come to hospital. So I think Chris is right about codes, but you know, if we haven't got the data, we can't code it. Sorry, Chris, I bet you fixed your microphone now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Um, so yes, so just going back to say, it's important that we've been able to get um, the codes into clinical systems so that we can start to record this information. And very important that that's been collaborative work um, run centrally, but with the, the supplier community. So we've got that consistency uh, across the country where people are using different systems to record this information. Um, some of this, it's worth saying, started a long time ago. So in early January, we started having conversations with um, Public Health England, who were, uh, for our international listeners and viewers, are our Centre for Disease Control, really about putting uh, symptom surveillance systems in place um, specifically for COVID and also for influenza-like illness so we can we could see spikes in baseline in the community um, at some level notwithstanding Trish's point that we don't have that uh, community level testing at the moment to get the most accurate data we could. So Ian um, going handing over to you um, you work um, very closely um, very closely the audio is super off now. Maybe that's the mainland uh, UK island connection. Not sure. So you're at um, Alderhey Children's Hospital and you're the clinical director of innovation there, Ian. Um, maybe you can tell us more about, we heard a lot about technology um, and how how is technology right now, innovation right now playing a role in the reaction to COVID? Well, I mean, I, I work at a, a, a really kind of large specialist children's hospital, which is very technologically advanced. Um, but there's not necessarily been a huge uptake of some of the technologies, things like telemedicine, artificial intelligence, even though we've had the capabilities there. And the thing that's been most amazing for me is to watch an overnight technological revolution amongst the attitude of the staff. So all of a sudden going from Oh, I don't touch it. I don't even like emails. I won't your emails. I won't bring your other stuff. We're gonna have to. Uh, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to do this. Um, do you start? Have to start. Have to start. And it, also the permissions that have been given for us just to get on and do it because it's in the best interest of the country. So you just it, it's it's just been incredible. All the all the barriers have just melted. Um, and it's not because there were never technological barriers. So we're always cultural and procedural and um, barriers that we were that we were contending with. So to to see it happen in a week, to to switch an entire service across the distance um, communication, the distancing among staff, that even the fact that I'm at home today, you know, it's just so it's just a revolution, really. So what are the like? To get a bit of an overview of, of certain examples of, um, of technological mm. innovations that are actually being used at the front lines to get a bit of an, an idea of, of that. So, say three weeks ago, I was still in the early phases of trialing how we coordinate our emergency team for surgery using uh, the Microsoft Teams platform. Um, now we've got like a hospital-wide deployment of it happening in a week. 
Um, you know, the, if you look at the stats of how people are using it, it's spiking. But the the thing which I find fascinating is the, the difficulty. There's been, there's been some technology teething problems in a, from a point of view of training people how to use it, but it's actually the etiquette and the culture of how you use the messaging, which has been the bit that I've spent most of my time like yellow carding people. It's like, guys, you know, you can't you can't use the channel like that. You know, don't make another new channel. You have to keep it this way. You know, trying to it's it's almost like reforming the social norms. That's that's been the bit that's that I'm doing most running around on. Um, so it's just it's it's really fascinating from that point of view. There's other areas like uh, 3D printing. We've got a big 3D printing program in the hospital which we used for our pre-operative planning models. Uh, but now we're quickly retasking to go right. We're going to have supply chain problems. We're going to need to make widgets and gadgets that that, that might help out. Like we just made a a, a special door opener. Of an antimicrobial copper filament, which allows people to open doors without touching them. We just made it. It's 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 provided that kind of um, environment of uh, innovation and let's just get this done and let's go and with the, the the direction of just do what you think is best for the patients and go for it. Um, so it's it's created a very well, from my point of view a very pure innovation environment. Thank you, um, Ian. We have about 520 uh, people watching from all over the world to today, which I'm very pleased. Um, I would like to encourage you, please send in your questions because we will have the possibility of actually asking these four uh, amazing guests here questions from all over the world regarding the situation in the UK and the response in technology. So, uh, Kate, while Ian was speaking, you were uh, nodding a lot for you for, at Microsoft. Can you tell us more about how you are working together with the NHS from a tech company point of view right now? Absolutely and I can maybe on the basis we've got so many people globally as well maybe I can touch quickly on some global offers and some global um, opportunities that we've got to help our, our partners and our customers globally as well. So yeah Ian I was nodding to not just the use case that you shared around using Teams, which is a communications and conferencing and collaboration platform that Microsoft has, but also to your reference about um, clinical people and you know admin people, information workers, that culture change, that forced um, adoption, if you like. While you know none of us like to be forced to adopt new technology, I think it's situations like these that break down those barriers um, from a cultural perspective and actually you know help encourage people to, to look at technology as an enabler rather than a blocker so that's really encouraging yeah so marguerite um at microsoft globally because we are a global company we've obviously had people um you know in china when when this first um broke ground as it were, was in end of december um, and as a result of that, we've been able to kind of keep pace a little bit with with what's been happening globally and the response that technology can play its part. And really, in reference to Microsoft's aims and ambitions and, and mission statement, which is to support people to to you know with the technology to to work better and work more efficiently as well. Um, on the fifth of March, we launched um, a global free teams capability for anyone in the world to respond to COVID-19 that felt that they that would help them so a lot of our customers already you know have teams as a capability within some of the packages they bought from Microsoft but what we're saying is you know we recognize that teams can hopefully provide um, an environment a digital environment for people to video call to do virtual consultations, to share information with colleagues, um, to keep teams, you know, communicating and, um, you know, together digitally, to co-author documents together in a digital environment, to share communications, all of these great stuff, which, which we hope will um, contribute to making that remote working for whoever it is just that little bit easier. So I think, the Teams aspect is is one aspect, um, and that's lovely. I think there's also, to your point of how can technology globally um, contribute some value to how people are gonna you know work and live for the next few months. Um, I think that deflection to try and help people help themselves 
is really important. So, you know, in the UK, we've got, um, you know, the 111 service online on nhs.net, which, um, which is absolutely vital for, for people to get some information, to help kind of self-serve and, and also to kind of deflect some, you know, the, the worried well, as well as we call it, in terms of helping them to identify. Um, so there's there's web, on, online web capabilities and solutions that's available too. Um, and then just touching, I guess, on um, maybe something that, that Microsoft is doing for their employees as we're now being forced to work, or not forced, highly recommended to work um, from home as much as possible and, and social distance if we're not key workers. Uh, we as an organization have been able to take advantage of some kind of good tips and techniques around home working. Um, we've got a great culture within Microsoft, which I know is the same in the NHS and, and for many of us where we work. And so making sure that we're looking after each other, you know, thinking about our, our kind of social distancing and how technology can help us look after our mental health as well um, is very important. We'll get to the social distancing bit in a in a in a bit. Um, so there are a lot of people who, are obviously, as you already Ian have said, a lot of people who have actually managed to do this huge cultural shift within a week. All of mm. us uh, who are working at home now, a lot of people can't work at home right now. Can't forget that either. Um, coming back to that, Trish, um, as primary healthcare givers, for example or uh, GP clinics that are now facing a lot of, as you said, also mentioned before, um, very, a lot of worried people um, who, who are used to just being able to go to the doctor when they have, whenever they have something they'd like to discuss. Um, you have looked into uh, the, the possibilities of video consultations. Um, now, how might video help reduce the contagion within the COVID crisis? Well, I mean, you know, contagion happens when you when you are close to someone physically, particularly within one meter for more than 20 or 30 minutes. That that's a sort of recommended advice. So obviously, phone or video is massively safer uh, in this highly contagious disease than meeting someone in the same room. So the question really is, when do you need video? Uh, and when can you just manage with a phone call? Because of course the telephone is a familiar technology, it's more than 100 years old, everybody's got one, and it's quick and simple and dependable. That's really important. Dependability is one of the key things uh, that, that stops people using technology. If you look at my Twitter feed uh, today and responses to a question I put out this morning about GP's experience with video consultations, We've already got people saying, well, I tried it, but I was halfway through and it broke down and that kind of thing. So the telephone is pretty good. The question is, when does the patient need uh, a video consultation rather than just a phone consultation? Uh, and it's pretty obvious. You know, the first thing is if the patient is quite sick or sounds as if they're quite sick, ideally you might have a telephone consultation which you can then flip into video uh, saying to the patient look I'd quite like to have a look at you can you turn your vision on that apparently that is possible with some technologies um, secondly if the patient is anxious there's no doubt that the research literature shows that what we call therapeutic presence is much stronger with the visual uh, feedback uh, and so if the patient needs reassuring and they can see the face of the doctor or nurse that, that is great. Um, Follow-up appointments where the patient is quite sick and, and you want to contact them the next day to see if they've got any worse. Again, that's it's quite reassuring if preferably the same clinician can uh, contact them by video. And then also stuff around comorbidities and additional things that, that make that patient's case just a little bit more complicated. The elderly patient with multimorbidity, um, the patient with perhaps cognitive decline or something like that and um, you've just got more of a bandwidth visually but it is a trade-off and, and the doctors are saying hang on we're trying to do this but it's new it's unfamiliar we'd rather just phone up the patient and I think over the next few weeks we're going to get much better data on which patients really need the video call and which can be managed by phone I'm just producing some guidance actually for the British Medical Journal on that and it should be out in the BMJ open access within the next 48 hours. Any trends you can already mention? 
Um, not really, because I, we're literally doing this in real time. Um, what I can say, um, and Chris has already said this, is that, that people who were quite opposed to using technology, uh, I mean, they used the phone for triage, but they weren't really using the phone much for clinical consultations. But people who were opposed to doing that are now uh, almost falling over themselves to do it. And that fits again with the research literature that the, that the biggest um, sort of unique selling point for any technology is relative advantage. In other words, is there a distinct benefit to using it over not using it? And suddenly with the contagion thing, the relative advantage of remote consulting is huge compared to face-to-face -face consulting. And so people are dropping a lot of their, uh, their sort of hesitations, which were uh, not irrational, actually. They were around quality and safety. People wanted to provide a professional, high-quality service, and they said, I'd rather see the patient, examine them, put my hands on them like I was taught to do. And now that trade-off has changed very dramatically. And as others on this call have already said, this is an opportunity, uh, you know, to, to some extent. So we're speaking, uh, like we've, we've heard it before in the last few days or weeks that um, speed actually trumps precision in this situation right now. Um, Ian, how have you been um, experiencing this when it comes to, like you mentioned before that it is a cultural shift mainly, Trish has also mentioned, but um, how do you actually do the, the technical shift like within an organization such as yours? The key thing is um, was cancelling a lot of our elective, in fact, almost all of our elective activity because we're in that preparation phase. Um, and I know it seems a bit like a can before the storm, because especially in children, children aren't particularly affected by this virus, luckily. Um, you know, our, our hospital is not being overloaded with demand at the moment, but we are running around getting prepared. Um, and the big thing about now is we're using the technology. So we, we ran our consultant meeting the other day. Normally, we've got 15 consultants in a room, all crammed in together, chatting away. We did it, uh, you know, technologically optimized using, you know, telecom. And that was difficult you know, to get people to do that. I've been seeing my patients, even though they've not got coronavirus, I've been seeing them using telemedicine because you need to start, you need to do it now and work these bugs out before we actually really, really need it. Um, and it, it was fascinating yesterday, because even me, I'm, I'm a massive technophile. I, I love technology, I always use technology, I can get away with it. Um, and I was using uh, it uh, to do teleconsultation with some of my patients. As one of my patients, I just thought, I just can't, I just don't feel comfortable using this with telemedicine. So I had to get in the car and drive all the way to the hospital to go up and feel their calf with my hand. And then, right, fine, thank you, and then leave again. And it's funny, but even, even me, and it's going to take a while to get used to this type of modality, but it's, um, you know, it's essential. Another example is uh, an outpatient clinic. Is that that shifting thing? Like I still do a traditional outpatient clinic, you know, where 15 patients come and there's a waiting room and see me. Um, and yesterday I looked into the waiting room and I saw the kid who I wanted to see and his mum and his granny sat in the waiting room. And I, the overwhelming guilt that I had is that like, I can't believe that I've brought, you know, a, a, an elderly person into the hospital. You know, it, you know so it, it was just like, right, come into the room, see you out the door and it's that sudden shift of risk benefit um, which is enormous. Now um, we're having a lot of questions coming in from the audience. Um, one sec I need to get an overview of what's coming in here. Wow okay lots of them. I'll get to them in a second. Um, I mean just, just while you're saying that I just just to add I mean firstly I think Trish and I should probably follow up afterwards about um, trying to identify any trends that are coming out. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of data and, and, and there's the potential for us to, to analyse that uh, or for, to get academics to an, analyse that quite quickly. Um, and I was struck by two things. One, the idea of how do we reduce face-to-face -face contact as much as possible and how do we do things at speed? And from our, our own perspective, um, in the last week, we've accelerated the release of um, a patient-facing patient app that actually, uh, going to Ian's point, we were probably a few months away from releasing with some more advanced functionality. 
but now was the time to do that because inside that app there are the ability to book appointments remotely uh, the ability to order to request your repeat medication uh, to have that bi-directional communication um, with the gp uh, without actually having to even have phone or, or video if that's appropriate but also with video consultations and with the ability to for gps to push out targeted advice to specific cohorts so there was there was things already available in that technology that could make a difference and we couldn't wait you know two months to do that the time was right to do that now what we've seen is is a really positive response it's been it's been used the uptake is there people are uh, are now keen to use the technology as much as possible and and as ian said i think some of those blockers have gone some of those are around really practical sensible advice that's coming out of the center from nhsx around information governance and around really clear straightforward guidance as to we should be trying to share data now um, some existing governance rules that have been more regionally based will probably cause friction points at this point because we know we're going to end up with people having remote consultations uh, they're in one part of the country and the doctor maybe is in another part of the country and we have to have that data flow so as Trish said we can see comorbidities we can see what medications people are on and we can make better clinical decisions you know by being able to access that data so there's a lot going on regarding uh, regarding um, data and technology, but there's also the people, what you just mentioned, Chris, the people uh, warning of um, privacy issues. And that's a, a legal issue as well, or a, a policy issue. Like, can, can, what, what are the dangers there? I mean, there was, there was a very welcome statement, I think, from the Information Commissioner. Uh, yeah. in the UK last week who said she can't envisage a situation during this crisis when any health and care professional delivering care to patients would would be uh, prosecuted on the back of data sharing so the idea that we need you know these are extraordinary times we need to be sharing that data and to get that clear guidance um, both from the centre but then from the information commissioner whose responsibility it is to say just use the information in the best way you can to treat patients as, uh, you know it, as well as possible uh, and and that is fine i think it's been a real positive culture shift uh, and allowed people to not just embrace the technology but use it in new ways what is the, what's the danger of opening the floodgates though and and like what once this is over and we all hope it's going to be over some at some point in time um can you can you go a step back ever uh, I mean, from my, I think everything we've seen actually is has been extraordinarily sensible and would be welcome for business as usual. Um, I think the technology that's been deployed and the data flows that have now been opened up and the the uh, new possibilities for workflow. Uh, you know, lest we forget, the 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 service was under a lot of pressure before this. Primary care has been under lots and lots of strain. Um, that that it wasn't going to get any easier, uh, and we, we understand that those pressures in general practice and in hospital were putting the service under lots of strain. So I I, I don't think we've seen anything extraordinary so far that wouldn't just be uh, a useful um, framework going forward um, when we get through this crisis. And still, we're hearing fears of like phones being tracked. A lot of people are anxious about their private phones maybe being tracked to prevent people from gathering, that's uh, the social distancing uh, topic, people from gathering in groups. Um, Trish, um, do you... Are people really worried about this? I think we've seen a complete change. I think they were worried about it a month ago. People were whinging about information governance and getting caught doing something they shouldn't. We've had very clear government level guidance in the UK that says, look, this is an unprecedented um, public health emergency, it is overwhelmingly in the public interest to share data and nobody's got time to start hacking into somebody else's phone calls. We're all really busy. I, I think the balance between benefit and harm is what we need to emphasize in healthcare. Um, and at the moment, the amount of harm that could be done by sharing data is much, much less than the amount of benefit that could happen. And I think clinicians are already shifting very rapidly. Um, the medical defense um, organizations are shifting their advice. The uh, professional bodies are shifting their advice. And as I said, the government is shifting its advice. So um, I haven't heard any lawyers jumping up and down telling people to hold back here. So I don't think we should be uh, worrying too much about that. Okay, thank you, Trish. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to switch to the audience questions now because I've had lots of them coming in here, which is really great. Thank you very much. Uh, shout out to to the, the world. Um, I will just start with some here. One of the questions is from Ewan. What can we do to maintain the digital revolution and pace of change after COVID has passed us by? I think that question might go to uh, Kate. That's a very good question. <clears throat> I mean, um, there's so much innovation out there, and especially if we think about the NHS sector in the UK, it's full of SMEs and fast moving enterprises and businesses coming up with new solutions. I'm not sure how we would maintain that level of kind of digital investment. But I can only hope and trust really that whatever we learn and how we work together during this time will fundamentally foster and change a different way of working and shift our mindset. That's I my saying, personal opinion. Yeah, I, I was sat with my older colleagues the other day, um, showing them how to, he doesn't even have a smartphone, showing them how to use a tablet uh, to do messaging and you know, to do handover summaries and all the rest of it. And we were sat, I've shown them some of the trial stuff I've been doing with it. And it was just, it normally hates tech. And, he, and I just heard him say it, it was lovely. He's like, he's like, oh, that's really good, isn't it? And I was like, yeah, I quite like it. Yeah, it's quite good. <laughs> and it was just, it was just lovely to, because he's minded open. Because I've shown him this before, but he just was ignoring it. But now he's just like, this is good for my patients. Um, I can make, you know, you can see how I can make a difference by, by not getting too close to them and keeping a distance. And that's how I can protect the patients. And that's all he's all about is he's, you know, he loves his patients. So his mind is now open. And it's, I think we've got to keep it open. So you're going to get, I think, a whole tranche of people who are being open to these new techniques. Um, so it'll be fascinating to see what happens when it does die down. Yeah, yeah and just to add, I mean, we've, we've seen now, a, we wanted community pharmacists in, in the UK to be able to prescribe electronically for a long time. So that you can, you don't need face to face, you don't need a piece of paper, you just go to the pharmacist and you get the medication you've been prescribed. And that was a project that has been, you know, been discussed and taken and been um, dragging, it's fair to say, for, for a while. And now we're in the situation where it's going to go live very, very shortly. Um, and that's just a good thing. So actually, the driver has been to bring forward really, really useful technologies uh, that people will never go back because it will just be much more convenient for people. It will take pressure off the service. Exactly. Okay, so I'll just come in with the next question now because that kind of fits it. Um, there's one thing is the cultural shift, but the other one is um, this question here is some NHS tr trusts, Angela is asking this, some NHS trusts will face temporary barriers to increasing remote working, for example, the availability of VPN licenses for staff in order to access hospital intranets, for example. How quickly can that be resolved within this very fast changing? environment can i answer that i mean i've i've seen this on um on twitter people are coming back to me and saying you know, i'd love to do this but my clinical commissioning group won't put you know whatever it is vpn uh, terminals are, are one issue um we wrote a paper recently around infrastructure and people focus very often on the microphone and the camera and the kind of getting the visual picture but actually it's all this kind of under the bonnet stuff it's the it's the connections it's the permissions it's the policies uh that can hold back look you're gonna have to, to ask your trust how long it's going to take because we can't answer that but somebody will be capable of cutting through the red tape and as i say there are policy makers now saying please cut through the red tape what mm -hmm. i would suggest is that and this is what they did at bart's health where we've been helping them for a, a few years now is they set up a central unit and i can't remember what they called it but something like a video consultation unit uh and they had people from the it department they had some clinicians they had some um senior managers quite a small agile team and then they were the, a sort of central go-to uh, interdisciplinary team uh, for trying to work through these problems but they are they are real they are difficult but they're not impossible to work through uh, and often what you have to do is introduce a workaround and then ask what can we do in the trust to make this mainstream rather than a workaround if you see what I mean 
uh, and, and you know what how would things need to change to make this business as usual so i hope that's a little bit of a tip although you know there are no uh, magic solutions to this just to, to to reassure people these conversations are happening between suppliers and 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 the government you know very very frequently so there are, the technical solutions are there um, you could download our software for example now and it would just work um, for people for, for example for the retired gp community uh, who are possibly coming on board or for self-isolating doctors but we just need to shift some of that red tape and make some decisions quickly over the next days and weeks uh, in order to make that happen so i i, I think it, the solution will come um it, it, it can, just, I, can i just so comment that this is, this is really important what we've got is increasing numbers of frontline nhs staff not able to see patients face to face, either because they're self-isolating or because they are uh, mildly sick but, but could still consult remotely, uh, or because they're, as you say, that what I'm calling the dad's army docs uh, of the of the people who've retired but are coming back to contribute. Now they could all work from home, provided they have access to the patient's medical record. But we are already finding that trying to consult from home when you don't have access to the medical record uh, is absolutely terrifying and probably doesn't help. So this is, this is really good news if you've got a way of um, just getting someone to be able to basically connect um, through a web password or something like that, it's great. Yeah, Marguerite, okay. I would add to Angela, you know, speak to your CCGs or speak to your trust IT, um, speak to your tech partners that are supporting you, speak to your vendors. Um, if there's any time that this can be resolved, it's now. I've been, I've, I've experienced that completely. It's just the case of, you know, all hands to the pump. We are rapidly expanding a number of licenses. If you look at what I'm looking at at the moment, I've got like three screens in front of me here. I've got every bit of data on all my patients i can prescribe in the hot to the hospital from here and have a live video link um it is incredible and we are we're rapidly ramping up my big worry is about all the kids coming off school and then getting on netflix and i was really happy to hear that the, they're throttling netflix's um bandwidth to make sure that we can maintain these uh these uh these contacts but it's and also the, the, the amount of hardware as well and a lot of our staff we actually don't have a computer at home and we are currently you know, repurposing about 300 laptops and distributing them out to just get people to be able to remote work. But it's great to watch people do it at such a speed and rate that we'd, if you'd said, we need to have the entire hospital ready for teleconsultation and remote working next week, you would have said, yeah. we'll never get the first meeting arranged. Um, but to watch it happen, it's incredible. Mm. And that going back to the government, I mean, the, the governance now advises bring your own device and use it if you can, if that works. And that is a, a step change from a few weeks ago. It's just one of those cultural uh, blockers that has been removed. So that's on, on, on one side of, of the issue. The next question from the audience um, coming from Ravi is how do we support how do we support patients to be able to video consult? For example, the elderly without tech know how no webcam uh, who might have not even heard of what's going on right now trish sorry repeat that question your audio just dropped My audio audio dropped. On. Um, on the other side of the whole issue how do we support patients to be able to video consult for example the elderly without tech know-how and without a webcam yeah, this is a really interesting one. Um, I think I, from what my GP colleagues are saying is that they have had successful video consultations with elderly people, provided they've got the tech uh, and they can be talked through the use of a device. Uh, now, that's not all elderly people, but then not all young people can do it either. Um, I think my personal experience is that older people very often have somebody else who can help them get set up so it's not just a question of who's digitally connected but it's also who else is with them uh you know we go and visit my mother-in-law and we've got an ipad that she can use uh to connect up to other family members for example and that's a very common situation i would also say that uh, our experience in the east end of london is that 
many of the elderly uh, patients in London are, or in certain parts of London, are first generation immigrants from uh, particularly the Indian subcontinent. And they've been using Skype for the last 20 years to keep in touch with family back home. And actually they are more digitally literate sometimes than uh, the indigenous white population. So there are certain population groups who are already um, really quite skilled at uh, connecting by video and are quite comfortable with it. But um, we do have to uh, remember that there is, a, there is a, a bit of a learning curve and a confidence curve for using video technology. The last thing I would say is that there are some video um, connection technologies now that are really simple. The Scottish people, for example, up in, uh, in Scotland, they've got this NHS near me where they use uh, something called Attend Anywhere. And it's one click on a button, it just takes you straight into what they call a virtual waiting room. Uh, and it, it's, I, I have not yet ever met a patient who's found it uh, too difficult to learn to use. Yeah, I've got a use case for that, Marguerite, if that's helpful at all, um, to answer Ravi. So Ravi, I've got a next door neighbour who's 84, who is who has a smartphone, but literally uses it on WhatsApp to keep in contact with two family members up in Manchester he has got an underlying health condition that means that he has to have regular um, appointments with his GP. My, my advice is if you're able or if you can identify someone who is helping um, a particularly vulnerable person, if they've got access to technology, then you can support them and arrange to either um, collect their technology from their doorstep and um, with their permissions, obviously, um, and help configure that for them. You can also find out from their GP what platform or application they want to use and use that first. You know, we're not, we've got to use what's available and what people are comfortable to, to use. It's not about using one or the other. Let's use what's out there. Um, and if that's something that they need a bit of help in, um, you can help them talk, talk through them with that with them um, and potentially join them remotely if you've got their permission to help them set them up as well. So there's a couple of different use cases. I know it doesn't answer, you know, what if I've, you know, how do we do it at scale? But I think we've all got to kind of um, band together, really. It actually brings us to the next question. Um, speaking of like here in Switzerland, what we've been seeing here now within the last uh, week, we're not... Uh, known for being a very like neighborly people but what we've been seeing is is a massive surge in in neighbor health um in, within the cities especially um and that brings us me to the next question by caroline is there a role for local organizations for example parish councils local volunteer groups to actually run community level symptom surveillance would would that help or confuse the picture for the NHS staff? And how would we communicate that information gathered in the community? Ian, can you? Well, I mean, I'm more with children, so it's probably not so useful from that point of view. Um, the, the big thing we've had from a volunteering point of view is people volunteering to help at the hospital. Um, and have been actually manning all the doors and making sure everyone's washing their hands um, as they come in. Uh, and some of the volunteers are actually, all just have an incredibly brave thing for them to do, but I'm sure that that's the type of thing for our hospital will make the biggest difference from a volunteering point of view. And um, the other thing is that um, I've been overwhelmed by technology companies offering to help us also, um, because you know they, they want to, to do their bit for us. I think very genuine approaches. Um, so, the, that kind of volunteering self-organization element I think can be very useful but if it's directed appropriately um, and I don't have anyone running around tables houses and spreading it that's that would be the last thing we want. So Trish can what I, would be yeah, yeah I mean this is a really interesting question and uh, you know I think everywhere around the world we're seeing communities coming together and all sorts of local groups coming uh, forward and self-organizing and also working together. And I think this is a very good example. You've got the community groups who are kind of, you know, making sure that the isolated older people are all right, perhaps delivering meals, you know, doing shopping, that, that kind of thing. And the question is, could they also provide sentinel data on outbreaks? I don't think so, because I think it, it would need to be piloted and set up in a way that we just don't have time to do. But I think there's one thing that those organizations can do and that is be alert to the fact that 
uh, COVID can deteriorate very rapidly, particularly in week two. So it behaves like flu or in a very similar way to flu, except in a proportion of patients where instead of getting better, they uh, develop a sort of precipitous deterioration in their breathing in that second week and they become very, very sick very quickly. Now, the local community organizations, I think, are in an extremely good position to pick up people who perhaps can't get through to their GP, they can't get through to the ambulance service, but they are uh, in, a, in a very sort of serious condition and they need to be fast tracked into medical help. Quite what you do about those cases is another matter, but I would suggest that local community groups, anybody who's doing the local resilience stuff needs to know the red flag signs and symptoms, particularly uh, worsening shortness of breath, uh, and, and, you know, other red flag signs like, um, you know, for example, not being able to rouse the person properly, you know, loss of consciousness or sleepiness, those kind of things uh, need to be fast tracked. So that's where I would, I would sort of link the health surveillance with uh, the community resilience more generally. And just very briefly, back to the question around symptom surveillance um, in the community, there is a plan um, centrally with the NHS to build a website where people can um, uh, fill in their details if they're self-isolating because we don't know at the moment uh, the numbers of people who are self-isolating and what uh, the demographic breakdown of those people are for example so I think community groups could have a role to play in encouraging people who might not know about that facility when it becomes available um, to either to fill that in or to help them to fill that in if it's you know if it's if it's an elderly person who's not used to internet technology so using sort of that, that community group and even Facebook groups etc to encourage people to do that would be extraordinarily helpful one more question which is a very important one I think so um, regarding the retired GPS that are being brought in uh, what did you call them the, the dad dad's army oh, the dad's, dad's army, army. Dog. That's mine. That's mine. I'm branding that uh, that that's, phrase. That's amazing. So speaking of the the dad or granddad's army, uh, a question from the audience: Is access to the System One platform being made available to these retired GPs for for free during this crisis, Chris? Yes. Yeah, so, so we we are. We have a solution that will work for, for retired GPs. We're speaking with um, NHS Digital and NHS X about the issue that was raised earlier around internet access and how we can get those GPs um, smart card credentials or how we can circumvent that so they can access records, they can electronically prescribe, they can order tests, for example. Um, and we will be uh, making that available freely to as many people as we possibly can over the next uh, weeks and months. Another question coming in, uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk about the ventilator shortage, not only in the UK, but globally. Um, I think the next one goes to Ian. Hi everyone, how do you assess the situation surrounding the ventilator shortage in the UK? How could new technologies aid the NHS and manufacturers in overcoming this? Would you? Uh, I'm not an expert in ventilator manufacturer, but it's incredibly worrying. I mean, if you look at the projections of how many critical care beds we need and how many critical beds care beds we've got, I mean, there's a there's a big mismatch. But it depends on how the modelling works out. Um, so it's it's just enormously concerning. I mean, I think we're going to have to, in the same way that we've become a bit more permissive around information governance, I think we're going to start having to look, you know take us into account when we're producing these ventilators. I see the government's been trying to retask other production lines, uh, helping companies that currently make ventilators to get them out faster. We've also been uh, looking to the governance rounds, uh, 3D printing spare parts. Um, if we got into a supply chain problem, just to keep some things operational. And it's not just about ventilators. A lot of it's about non-invasive ventilation around oxygen, around the number of oxygen points you need to have available. Um, to deal with this surge in patients, which um, you know, seems like we're going to be getting. So I think we're just going to have to get quite inventive um, of what we're doing. And we have to you know, keep in mind the risk benefit. And this is an environment where the risk benefit of doing things has just suddenly become massively skewed in the favour of just getting on and doing it. Yeah, totally agree. Do you want to add anything, Trish? 
No, no, no. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to say for expert at all, but I would totally agree with, with what Ian's saying. It's, it's this huge change in the risk benefit ratio that, that I think, you know, when we look back at what, what happened during this pandemic, uh, that is going to be the thing that people are going to be writing about. It, it, it's that, you know, all the rules went out the window, basically. I mean, and that's okay. just, yeah, I mean, you just got to think about it. I mean, the rules were there for a reason. You want your ventilator to be made to an incredibly high standard. That is massive common sense um, for that to happen because you don't want a ventilator to break or to fail. Um, but if you're faced a situation where you need to make another 5,000 of them in a couple of months, then I think we just need to say, well, you know, do you want a slightly more suspect ventilator or no ventilator? Um, so that's the situation we're in. Very important question and uh, a big concern to a lot of people. We have another seven minutes to go. I have a few very interesting questions here, so I'm just going to go through them and uh, try to get as many answered as possible in this great opportunity here. So one question is uh, regarding, again, data privacy. Um, a pandemic opens up particular challenges to maintain public trust in the ways in which health data is used. How do the panel believe the NHS and public health authorities should act in order to ensure that new data practices necessarily set up to support COVID-19 efforts do not undermine future trust in its uses, for example, for research planning and purposes beyond direct care. That's quite an interesting one, isn't it? Um, mm. Can I have a go? I think we are going to need to think about things like privacy and trust when we have time to catch our breath and reflect on what has happened. And I think one of the things that's going to feed into our deliberations on that are going to be the stories that get told of what happened during this crisis. Uh, and there will be positive stories and negative stories uh, and ambiguous stories. And I think that kind, the kind of advice and ways forward that the questioner is asking about are things that we can't answer now but i i think we will be able to once we kind of look back and see what happened and learn from our real experience i think it will inform um you know the the ethical um deliberations that we are going to be uh doing going forward although mm. having said that i was looking this morning at, at the learning from sars and there's all sorts of things that that uh, were published in about 2009 um where we, which we should have learned from and somehow didn't because when sars went away we all forgot about it which is a bit of a shame but um you know let's see what happens apart from countries yeah. such as taiwan for example yeah I've, I've got a view on this so you know a few months ago um a lot of the conversations that we would be having with nhs um data and ai experts were all around ethical use of data and how and, and what is ai and how does that differ from from other solutions and how we use data so we'd already kind of started having those more complex conversations about who profits from data how do we maintain the governance security um and compliance with gdpr um and all of that good stuff um, and i think to trisha's point we'll have to take our learnings when we get through this storm, frankly. But I think, um, you know, in partnership with the governance bodies centrally in the NHS, the ICO Commission and the focus on this, um, I've got the confidence that we can kind of continue that conversation in a sensible way afterwards. I mean, I think a key thing for it is, um, is not what you've done, but why. Um, and and because trust is such an important part of the doctor-patient relationship, and you know, I, I'm a surgeon. You know, I make mistakes, and you know, we have outcomes and complications which you don't want. But the thing which matters most to a patient is is why does something happen? Did it happen because you didn't care? That's the worst thing that can ever happen. Did it happen because you were trying to make money? That's another one of the worst things that ever happen. Or did it happen because you were genuinely trying to do what you thought was best? Mm -hmm. And when you, when you lay that out in front of a patient, I have. You know, really incredibly rare experiences of that of people not understand that and and losing trust in that sort of scenario. So I think here, I think we can really genuinely say, look, we were trying our very very best to try and reduce the impact of this terrible virus. Um, yeah. And 
that's the that's the overriding sentiment behind it. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, that people won't view this badly in the future. And, and just to to back that up, I think we lose trust when people don't know what the data is going to be used for. And in the yeah. explicit circumstances where you tell people how it's being used, I think that trust is there. So we do have a new data flow this week that uh, we've been directed to do from Secretary of State, which is to provide data to NHS Digital so they can uh, combine that with other data sets to identify the medium risk and the high risk COVID patients. So that can be pushed back into electronic patient records, made available to GPs, put on the summary care record, and people understand that that's an important data flow and it will make a difference um, to direct care. And at that point, I don't think you do get people who have a problem with that. Um, I think it's when it's more nebulous uh, that you, you, you start to run into the trust issues. Um, so I think if, if, if that transparency is there about how the data is going to be used, uh, I think we'll get through with no problem. Hmm. Thank you very much. We have to wrap up soon in three minutes. I have one last question regarding not only the physical health, but mental health. One question from Ellie coming in. How do the panel believe this pandemic will have an impact on mental health of the population from getting the disease? having vulnerable family members or not being able to leave the house due to isolation, isolation themselves. Is the NHS putting anything in place to support the mental health, as we know it has been so underfunded in the past and could be needed now more than ever? Is there any tech that could be used to help? Um, Maybe right, I can short round up with everyone. I can answer that. Um, so, so the mental health sector has been one of the leading groups to be developing uh, video consultations, for example, counselling, psychiatry, psychology. Um, they've, they've really led the field. And for example, up in Scotland, there's a group of consultant psychiatrists and I think psychiatric nurses who have just finished producing national guidance on video consultations for mental health patients. Now, that's the first national guidance I've seen it for any um, service in in any country you know so it's the cl clinicians and professional groups have got together so that's that's good news you know the technology does fit very well with mental health consultations um, the other thing I would say is that GPs are picking up a lot of anxiety and actually you know obviously if you already have anxiety as a mental health condition uh, you're going to be going uh, you know you're going to have even more problems right now um, with the kind of everyone being kettled together in the house and all that kind of thing. Um, and GPs are aware of it. Most anxiety, depression, most mental health conditions are managed in general practice. And um, GPs are trying their best uh, to cope with that. And, and what I've heard from GPs is yes, this counts. You know, you don't actually have to have a fever of 38 degrees to, to, to need an urgent input from a doctor or a nurse. Uh, so they are kind of um, taking the mental health acute symptoms quite seriously, making sure that, that uh, they, those patients are challenged to the, to the right person that can deal with them. Uh, whether or not we're going to get more money for mental health services in the UK uh, as a result of this, I can't answer, but if I see Matt Hancock, I'll, I'll let him know because I totally agree with you. It's been an underfunded service for some time. Sure, that's one of the questions that will have to be answered in, in thoroughly in depth in future. Um, I would like to thank you all for joining me today in this interesting uh, session. Thank you to the whole audience um, for joining us. Um, have a good day, Chris, Trish, Ian and Kate, and wish you lots of success, if that's the appropriate word, and uh, take care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for organising.